This side is more than it appears from the highway. Fort Vasquez was the first fort in the South Platte Valley. There's a lot of myths about our site. They built the highway around it because this is where it really was. All of the stories that you hear about the Wild West, from the first Anglos that came out here, the traders and trappers, all the way up to the railroads and the cowboys, it all happened right here. This kind of fort is what's called a factory fort. It's, it's specifically here for trading. There were never any soldiers here. There were probably 20 people working here, mostly men, dressed like I am, would have been businessmen supported by mountain men and trappers and traders who would have been employed here. So much of our early history is so misunderstood uh, because of the fighting and stuff that came later, but it's important for people to understand the relationship that happened here. The trappers and traders who came out here they were doing business with the people who lived here before they got here. There were 50 Cheyenne and Arapaho lodges outside the fort's walls that were being constructed. That's probably 300 people in those lodges. The traders and trappers learned how to survive out here from the Native Americans. They learned where to get good water. They learned which game trails to take, which ones to avoid. They learned where the hazards were, what the weather was going to do. All of these things they learned from the people here that they were relying on to make money from. The fur trade is, is generally a period of cooperation. It had to be. If we were out here mistreating these people, we wouldn't make any money and we could end up in a bad situation because there are a lot more of them than there were of us. There are many lessons there that, that we could have taken from that period that we chose to ignore as settlers and pioneers. We get people all the time who've lived around the area for a long time. They say they've driven by here for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and they stop here and it just changes their entire life. This area was on what was called the Trapper's Trail. Lancaster Lupton came out to the Fort Laramie region in 1836, came down, started building his fort in 1837. Traders generally started in St. Louis and came out here with goods that they wanted to trade for either beaver hides or buffalo robes. This was a classic American entrepreneurship. Their object was, of course, simply to trade as cheaply as possible for as many hides as they could get, get back. And a good stiff drink always made trading a little easier. It was uh, for profit only. There, there was uh, no ethics, no morals. It was make money, get back home safely so that you could uh, start a business that was in the civilized part of the, of the country. The uh, rebuilding of this reconstructed fort began in the fall of 2004. It's as best we can determine from the limited uh, descriptions uh, that were available. And there was a two-story uh, watchtower. There was also a, a trade gate. And a trade gate is, is a double set of gates. The inner gate could be closed, and between it and the outer gate, trade goods could be displayed for visiting Cheyenne and Arapaho. They generally didn't trust the Native Americans to be inside the fort, so they would take the goods over there and trade over there. In 1837, Ben St. Vrain built Fort St. Vrain, which doesn't exist anymore, and they basically undercut uh, the other forts. And by 1844, Fort Lupton is out of business. Just like today, uh, some things work out and others don't. The fort was built in 1858 and it lasted until 1883. It controlled the traffic going north and south. And it was basically here to protect the settlers. And then later, once the Utes were given the San Juan Mountains for a reservation, and then somebody discovered silver over there, then the fort became it protected the Indians from the settlers. Uray, who was a, a chief of the Utes, was well known to the, the people at Fort Garland. He was a personal friend of Kit Carson. Kit Carson used to live in that building right there. He married a, a Cheyenne woman whose name translated meant making out road. He came home one night and found out he had been Cheyenne divorced. That means all your stuff's out on the front of the teepee and you're gone. Most of the time, there's very few people here. From, you know, a dozen or so, to 1500, just depending on, on the day and the time and what was going on. A lot of people don't realize there was actually Civil War battles in New Mexico and this far west. The conflicts were not here, but these soldiers participated in a lot of them. Buffalo soldiers arrived here in Fort Garland. I spent about three years here. But we were here on guard duty and we came down here primarily to help settle the problem with the Ute Indian. That was in 1879, 1880. And this is where the Depression came in. 
I have to kill these people in order to prove that I'm worth not killing. That takes something mentally. This was not a, a choice location. I mean, it, it's isolated. It's cold in the wintertime. So there was a great change in learning how to deal with the environments here as well as with the people here. To be here for 25 years was, was a, really a long time. There's only so many ways to get across the mountain, and once you've found it, why people used it. I'm in a place called Fort Garland. If you haven't come down here, you're missing a big part of history. It began in 1862 with the establishment of Camp Collins, uh, which is actually up by Laporte. This was a, um, a camp established to help protect the uh, Overland Stage uh, and the Overland Trail. It was named after Colonel William O. Collins, who at the time, in the early 1860s, was the commander at Fort Laramie. The Overland Mail started going through here. They were beginning to see some settlement in the area and then um, they got wiped out by a flood in the summer of 1864. Joseph Mason, who was a very early settler here, had some land in the vicinity of what is now Fort Collins, and he had pointed out to the military this uh, area near his farm that was on a rise. And so after doing some scouting around, they decided that they would, they would reestablish Camp Collins at this new location. In the military terms, camps were uh, much more temporary. When they rebuilt the new Camp Collins, they had a very um, specific layout and structures that were, that were physically built, uh, log structures, and so it became much more of a, a permanent thing and they started calling it Fort Collins. There were beginning to be more uh, settlers, more movement into the native territories out here. The buffalo were getting moved out. That all started having an impact on, obviously, on the Native Americans and their, their uh, traditional grounds. And so the military was called in to protect primarily the Overland stage um, mail delivery, but also some of the immigrants in the area. By 1866, the Transcontinental Railroad had come in, so there really wasn't uh, a need for the camp anymore. A military uh, tribunal came through and did a lot of uh, looking around, and, and General Sherman was part of that inspection detail, and he recommended that the camp be, that Fort Collins be abandoned. And it's really interesting in the sense that, that all this happened in the span of about five or six years.